how do you respond to the verse in Revelation about being cast into the lake of fire if your name isn't written in the Lamb's book of life? Yeah, I right. took the last Revelation one. You take this one. <laughs> uh, read that again. How do you respond to the verse in Revelation about being cast into the lake of fire if your name isn't written in the Lamb's book of life? Revelation 14, 11. Yeah, I believe it. So as Greg has talked about earlier tonight, this um, category of apocalyptic uh, literature, the two main books in the Bible that are this type of literature are the book of Revelation and a big chunk of the book of Daniel. And so, th again, this, this is a kind of literature. Uh, it's not kind that we tend to write today, and so when we come to it, uh, we're not quite sure what to do with it in terms of what are the rules of interpretation. In the ancient Jewish world, this is a very common type of literature they would have been familiar with. Um, what that means is we have to do some sort of historical study to ask the question, what's going on in apocalyptic? Turns out that what is going on in apocalyptic is things like this. A lot of visual imagery uh, designed to speak theological, make theological points with, with vivid imagery. That's one thing. Another thing is a lot of symbolism uh, and a lot of numbers oftentimes that refer or make reference to symbolic sort of theological points. And you find that all over Revelation. Now when you come to, th that, when you know those things and now you read a verse like this, this, this lake of fire, and that everyone's going to be thrown into it whose name isn't written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you've got the, the difficult question now of saying, when you find this in an apocalyptic text, how literal do you take that? Right? And now you'll see the four views and how they would respond to this text. The, the traditional view would say, yes, apocalyptic is, it has a lot of symbolism, but that fire is literal because it's not only in, a, in Revelation that that's talked about, Jesus talks about a furnace of fire. It's found in the Gospels. Paul talks about a burning in 1 Corinthians 3. So there, there, it isn't just here. Therefore, this can be taken literally, and that's how you have traditional view that says the fire is a literal thing, and everyone who's not uh, written in that book of, of, of heaven, the book of life, will be, will be cast in there. Um, now, an annihilationist is going to come to that very same text and say, you know what, I can take that fire literally, just as literally as you can, but what does fire do? Fire consumes. And they will now look at the destruction text and say, when they will be cast in the lake of fire, but that fire is going to ultimately destroy them. A universalist comes along and can affirm that fire, maybe not as literally, but can still say we can take it seriously. Because what the fire does is the fire works like a refiner's fire. And this, they can show a lot of Old Testament texts where fire works to refine people, not destroy them or punish them forever, but to burn the dross, the, the impurement out of their life. The universalists are going to say, yeah, they're thrown in the lake of fire in order to be purified so that one day they can hopefully enter heaven. So, again, it's a, it's a tough type of literature to interpret in the first place. In all three of those positions, can take it uh, seriously, if not literally. It's important to remember that, that uh, the book of Revelation, like all apocalyptic texts in the ancient world, it would have been read, it performed for congregations. Um, out loud. Uh, out loud. Uh, that's what I mean. It's not, it's not, in fact, it says in the beginning of the book of Revelation, you know, let uh, the reader yeah. was it, let understand, be understand yeah. and let those who hear yeah. be blessed or something like that. Yeah. But there's a reader and, and hear. So the best way to, you've got to put yourself in a position of a first century person, know a little bit about apocalyptic uh, uh, symbolism, and, and then have someone read the book to you to get the, you know, the, the way it was intended to be heard. And uh, the thing about apocalyptic imagery is it's, it's, it's kind of like surrealistic poetry. I mean, it's, it's intended to evoke strong emotions. Uh, but I don't believe it's intended to communicate literal details on metaphysics. It's tended to evoke action. Uh, and, and, um, and so I, I wouldn't press it too much for, for, for uh, details. One more thing. And that is that uh, sometimes po folks uh, uh, point out that in Revelation 14, it says the, the smoke of their torment went up forever and ever and ever. And, th and then that's used to uh, try to prove eternal conscious torment. You've got to be very careful, not only because you're dealing with apocalyptic imagery, but because that imagery, actually, you find several places throughout the Bible. If you look at Isaiah chapter 34, verse 10, for example, uh, you have this destruction of the city of e uh, Edom. And there it says, and the smoke of their uh, destruction will ascend forever and ever and ever. But if you go back to Edom now, you're not going to find any smoke thinking. I never checked that out, actually. I'm assuming. <laughs> but it's meant to be a graphic imagery. So even outside of apocalyptic literature, you find that kind of symbolism. It's meant as a memorial. It's like they'll always remember the judgment that took place here. And I remember the fire. Our God is a consuming fire. I don't think the fire of God's wrath is any different than the fire of God's love. What's different is what kind of material goes into that fire.
And what's the state of the heart as you enter into the fire of God's love?